Hi, so let me just cut to the chase, because I've been churning out draft after draft after draft of this script, trying to express exactly what my problems are with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, and really the whole of the MCU's fourth phase. But for whatever reason, I've been having trouble getting the wording just right. The more and more I sift through this whole mess, the more schluck that I find. And now that I'm hopped up on enough sugar to take down an adult elephant, I think I'm finally ready to present my findings to all of you lovely people. Now, I will be the first to admit that after my initial view of Senor Strange inside of the mom, I actually went out on record saying that I liked the film. And you know what? I still do. I still had a good time watching it, I saw it twice in theaters and enjoyed it both times, and fuck, I'd see it again if anyone wants to go with me. I I'm being serious, is anyone free this weekend? But I've given this film a lot of thought since it came out, and it's kind of forced me to stop ignoring one of the most glaring problems with the MCU that's been plaguing this franchise ever since Endgame. And that problem is that Marvel does not understand how the multiverse works. Now in case you haven't been paying attention for the past, like, three years, or you've just been conveniently living under a rock, the multiverse has been the focus of a lot of the MCU stuff to come out recently. Actually all Marvel stuff in general now, including Sony's live action Spider-Verse that nobody fucking asked for. But of course I have to give credit where credit is due. Back in 2008, Marvel Studios did something unprecedented and hella risky by creating one large cinematic universe to scale multiple franchises and go on for nearly a decade and a half and counting. Nothing like this had ever been pulled off successfully before nor since, and it has not been for a lack of trying, I assure you. And while the MCU got off to a pretty rocky start and has had its fair share of problems, I can't commend them enough for the effort of creating something so incredible. I can't say I love Phase 1 overall, but it has its gems, and Phases 2 and 3 have some of the best movies to come out in the last couple of decades. It's truly an impressive feat. But if I'm being honest, all of that just makes me sadder to see what this franchise is becoming, even though it had endless amounts of potential to keep itself going for years to come. And like I said, it all started with Endgame. The very same film that was meant to be the finale of over 10 years worth of long-form storytelling. Even though there were plenty of threads left open to keep this world alive and fresh, it also served as a bit of a jumping off point for anyone who was invested in the MCU but would rather see it end on a high note. In its own way, Endgame kinda represents the MCU as a whole for me. It's riddled with so many flaws that are kinda hard to overlook, but has so many great moments and emotional payoffs that it left a lot of people satisfied, myself included. And I still really like the film even though there are enough holes in it to absolutely obliterate your average block of Swiss cheese. And I'm not gonna sit here and explain what the multiverse is to a bunch of people who are geeky enough to have willingly clicked on a Marvel video. I assume you're all familiar with the concept. But there is a generally accepted way that the multiverse probably works, assuming it's even real. Since it's only a hypothetical, nothing is set in stone, which means that if you're writing a story with this concept in mind, you can write the rules however you want them to be, as long as you remember those rules and keep consistent with them. But one of the major problems I'm seeing with the MCU is that it doesn't bother to make a distinction between alternate timelines and alternate universes. According to Endgame and Loki, the two are one and the same, which causes major problems with the world building and the stories that the multiverse is presented in. It's not helped that the writers don't really bother to coordinate with one another and so they keep contradicting each other's stories, but even if they did, they'd still have a tough job ahead of them because they've backed themselves into a corner. Keep this in mind because it's basically the main issue I have with how any of this works, and I'm going to be hearkening back to it a lot throughout this video. The generally agreed upon consensus for how the multiverse ought to operate as a storytelling device is that alternate timelines are their own thing set within one single universe. If you change something in the time stream and it branches off into a different timeline, that is still part of the original universe in which the event took place, but now the original timeline either no longer exists or is now inaccessible to the time-traveling characters. Alternate universes exist in their own separate category and have their own completely isolated isolated set of timelines and alternate timelines. In fact, despite the many problems I've had with this show over the years, The Flash actually handles this concept better than the MCU does. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's handled well due to the show's stubborn refusal to commit to a definitive rule on how time travel works, but certainly better. The Arrowverse deals with the concept of its own respective multiverse quite a lot, and The Flash is one of the shows in the Arrowverse that does time travel. <laughs> But the way they go about it is that when Barry fucks up and changes the timeline, something which he does rather frequently, by the way, alternate timelines are created, but those alternate timelines don't affect the other universes. There's actually a scene in Season 3 where two characters from a different Earth notice subtle differences that didn't exist in the previous timeline because they were in a separate universe when the changes were made. Let's go to the Speed Lab. Speed Lab. 
I suppose that means you traveled back in time again. Oh, you figured that out pretty quickly, Harry. Yes, Miss West. It was easy because we've never been here either. Nope. The reason I would strongly advise against doing what Marvel has done is because it makes it very easy for future stories to contradict one another in small, seemingly harmless ways. But those contradictions really add up over time, and frankly, I don't think anyone involved in the decision making over at Marvel has picked up on any of these issues, nor would they care all that much regardless, since every new show put out in the last couple of years has been praised relentlessly. Oh, how I miss the days of Daredevil and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Those were simpler times. Anywho, since the MCU has cemented that alternate timelines and alternate universes are the same thing, we now have to break down the time travel logistics of Endgame. And anyone who spent more than a few seconds trying to do that will tell you that none of it makes any goddamn sense. The explanation we're given by Professor Hulk is that every time you change any event in the timeline, it automatically branches off into its own new timeline so as not to affect the main timeline. Which means it also branches out into an entirely new universe. And I decided to paraphrase here because the way he goes about explaining it in the film is very roundabout and needlessly confusing. Confusing. If you travel to the past, that past becomes your future, and your former present becomes the past which can't now be changed by your new future. Exactly. Now, the film itself doesn't really even stick to these rules because in the scene where Bruce talks to the Ancient One, she says that a branch reality is only created when one of the Infinity Stones is taken out of its place in time, which is not the same thing. That would mean that every action these characters take while time traveling is now a solidified event that took place within their own timeline. Because even if Steve put the stones right back to where they were taken from, as we see him do at the end of the movie, that still means that all the events that that took place in order to get the stone have to have happened in the 616 timeline, and therefore took place in the 616 universe. That is what this film is telling us with this scene. You're probably telling me that I'm splitting hairs, but these are two entirely different explanations, and both are conveyed as the definitive explanation for how time travel works. But since the second one fucks with pretty much everything, I'm gonna choose the lesser of two evils here and go with option one. The film still contradicts that by the end, though. In the very final scene, in an attempt to outclass Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi as far as character assassination is concerned, Steve Rogers puts all the stones back where they belong in their respective timelines and then decides he's gonna try out that simple life Tony got a slice of, and so he goes back to the 1940s and decides to live out the rest of his days with Peggy Carter. This is something that a lot of fans of the character, myself included, take issue with because this completely tears apart his arc throughout the entire Infinity Saga. But putting that aside, because I'm not here to talk about how horribly fumbled the characters have been recently, this is a moment that also affects the time travel rules explained in the film. By him being here at all, it means that he traveled back to the 1940s and lived out the rest of his days in the 616 timeline. We know for a fact that he didn't spend those days in a separate timeline and then jump back to 616 just to give Sam the shield, because his only way of doing that would have been through the time machine that all of the other characters in the scene were standing right in front of. So if portrayed accurately to its own rules, they would have been expecting Steve to show up looking like Chris Evans, but then Joe Biden would have appeared in his place, confusing the characters and audience alike and serving as a daunting reminder that the United States never stood a chance. Instead, the characters start running around like headless chickens wondering where Steve is until Bucky sees him off in the distance sitting on a bench. The only other explanation you could really even try to muster for this is that he's stuck around in this timeline for all those decades without changing a single thing, and of course I would laugh right in your face because... No. Endgame really is a hot mess when you break it down, but it's my hot mess, and I love it. It's made even worse by Loki for a multitude of reasons. And wouldn't you know it, Loki and Multiverse of Madness were actually written by the same person. How about that? For the record, I actually like both of these things, but for two pieces of fiction that are meant to take place within the same continuity and were written by the same exact guy, I'd expect a lot less contradictions between the two. Though I suppose that's jumping ahead a bit. Right now, I want to talk about why this show fucking ruins the rules established in Endgame. For those uninitiated, the premise of Loki is that there's an organization of time cops called the Time Variance Authority, or TVA, if you don't have the time. <laughs> Basically, they work for Kang, and Kang pre-writes everyone's destinies in an attempt to keep all of reality condensed to one single timeline. This is so he can prevent any multiversal wars, which apparently were a thing back when the multiverse existed, but now it doesn't. 
because of Kang. Perfectly not confusing. If someone steps even slightly off of their path, it can be something as mundane as showing up late for work, then they get pruned. Translation, they get sent to the end of the timeline to be consumed by a fucking cloud monster. Entire branches in the timeline are literally a race from existence so as to maintain one single universe. Now let me ask you this before we continue. If a tree falls over in the woods but nobody is around to hear it, did the impact of the tree when hitting the ground make any noise? Yes, I know this question is a meme because it's stupid, but apparently whoever came up with some of the rules in this show is a bit slow on the uptake. Case in point, one of the main plot points in Loki is that the variant of himself that he and Owen Wilson are hunting throughout the timeline is hiding in various Armageddons on different planets. This is because apparently, if you go to a world-ending disaster and affect the course of things, you don't end up changing anything because all the things you did essentially get erased so when the world ends. They seem to believe that just because nobody will live on to remember the changes that were made to the timeline, that those changes are somehow not big enough to branch into their own separate realities. Just a minute ago, we established that the TVA recognizes all deviations from the sacred timeline, as they call it, as causes for a universal erasure, even something as simple as showing up late to work. But something like this doesn't branch off into its own reality because a fucking volcano is coming? You do realize that had Loki not freed these goats, the people watching him would still have made different decisions in their final moments of life than they're making right now. Instead of watching him in confusion, they would have been doing whatever the fuck ancient Pompeii citizens did right before they were all wiped from the face of the earth. Which means separate events take place, therefore a separate universe would be created. But I suppose this can be forgiven since apparently everything that happens is dictated by one human being sitting behind a desk at the end of the timeline, so I guess it's only if he notices anything different then it's a problem. I guess that's the explanation the show is going with, but if that's the case then how the fuck does any of this work? Are you telling me Kang is omniscient? Because that's the only way he could possibly know how every event across all time and space plays out and does so according to his whim. And yes, I'm talking about every single detail. Please sign to verify this is everything you've ever said. What? But even if he is, how is that the case? He's just one human being. He clearly doesn't have any actual powers, so how is he able to do any of this? Also, it doesn't really matter if he notices or not, right? Because the cosmos are a vast and complicated thing, and if the rules are that one small change can cause a branch reality, then that's simply the way of things, and so changing minute details in the timeline would cause a branch in the timeline to appear regardless of if Kang notices the change, which would then alert the TVA to Sylvie's exact location. I know at the end of the show, Kang reveals that everything Loki and Sylvie did throughout the series was actually exactly what he wanted them to do, which is bullshit for a whole other load of reasons. But since that's their explanation, I'll excuse this. This just means he knew where Sylvie was hiding all those times and simply didn't clue in the TVA because it wasn't yet time for her to be found, and that's all fine and good as far as I'm concerned. But my issue would then be, why establish the Armageddon rule in the first place if it causes this many holes in the writing? To reinforce my earlier point a little bit, I know a lot of you guys are probably saying I'm nitpicking, but here's the thing. The little shit really adds up over time, and there are a lot of little problems with these stories. That's why I'm making this video at all, because Multiverse of Madness caused my suspension of disbelief to shatter. It's so inconsistent now that even I'm finally saying something, and I don't think you guys realize just how much dumb shit I've been willing to overlook in these shows. Besides, I really don't consider it a nitpick when it causes major developments in the story that otherwise wouldn't have taken place. If they hadn't established this rule, then Loki and Sylvie never would have been trapped on the lean planet TM, and they would never have bonded, and whatever relationship they ended up developing wouldn't have happened. This is why I hate the usage of the term, because people typically only use it when you bring up a criticism that they simply didn't notice. Anyway, this show is actually what establishes that alternate timelines and universes are the same. If you go back and just have the context of Endgame, then that isn't actually the case. But this is one of the main reasons why the show really fucks with everything and breaks the already very messy lore in Endgame. By the way, this show wrote it so that the multiverse didn't exist at all until Sylvie killed Kang, but that's also stupid because the multiverse was referenced all the way back in the first Doctor Strange. This universe is only one of an infinite number. Who are you in this vast multiverse? Mr. Strange? Now, you might be arguing that because of time travel or whatnot, her doing this means that the multiverse now always existed, but to the people who say this, I really don't think you're thinking this one all the way through. Let's break it down. The multiverse is created when Sylvie kills this version of Kang, and the only reason that happens is because the events of the series take place according to Kang's design. But the events of Loki are kicked off with him escaping during the chaos in Endgame, and the entire plot of Endgame only happens because of this. <laughs> 
If you still aren't picking up what I'm throwing down, let me put it like this. If you continue to follow this thread, the only reason Thanos was able to wipe out half of the universe is because Doctor Strange gave him the Time Stone, which was only able to happen because he gained possession of it in his first film. And that only happens if he goes on the weird multiverse acid trip. If you follow chronology, the events of Loki are hinged on the multiverse existing at the time of Doctor Strange, but we now know from this show that there's a reality out there that exists where the Ancient One says this line despite the fact that no such multiverse exists. I think you're overthinking it. I think you're underthinking it. This show is also in conflict with what's established in No Way Home, but I'll be fair and concede that Loki did come out first, so the fault should actually go to the writers of that film. But I don't really care whose fault it is, just that it is. Like I've been saying, by making it so that alternate universes are the same as alternate timelines, you're boxing yourself in, because now showing me three different versions of Peter Parker all interacting, but not all looking relatively identical to one another, is gonna have me scratching my head. If we're keeping accurate to Loki, then two different timeline variants of 616 6 Peter Parker would just also look like Tom Holland, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, I was obviously ecstatic to see Toby and Andrew back in their roles, of course, but that's also kind of the problem that this video has made to highlight. They prioritize fanfare over consistency in writing, and that's a bad thing regardless of how much I love No Way Home. And no, I'm not saying they should have changed it to three Tom Hollands, of course. If we're changing anything, then change the writing in Loki to simply make it so that the timelines and universes are different things. That simple fix would seriously solve most of the problems in this video. For the record, I've also avoided using the word dimensions in this video in lieu of universes, because that's another thing that the MCU has been doing in these things. They keep using the terms interchangeably despite the fact that they're actually different things. Take for example the Dark Dimension, which is where Dormammu is hanging out in the first Doctor Strange. That is a subsect of the 616 universe, and any other universe would have its own respective Dark Dimension. And I don't know, I guess that's kind of what I would classify as more of a nitpick, because it doesn't actually affect the story too much, but it does still bother me. Finally getting into Multiverse of Madness territory a little bit more, let's talk about how this movie completely fucks with Loki, which again is very impressive because the two were written by the same person. This film introduces us to and is centered around the character America Chavez, who has the ability to jump to and from any universe across the entire multiverse. They also go out of their way to tell us that she is the only one across infinite realities that has this power, and she's the only America Chavez in all of existence, which already sounds a bit far fetched when we're literally talking about infinity that's incomprehensibly vast and you're telling me that there isn't a single other person with this power? Oh. Well, that's awkward. But also, hearkening back again to the alternate timelines equals alternate universes bullshit, that means that every single time a character in this movie, including America, makes even the tiniest decision, a branch reality would be created, right? Which means that every single time a character in this movie makes a choice, a new alternate version of America comes into existence. And that's without mentioning all the Wandas that are being replicated who are all uber powerful and hellbent on accessing the multiverse. Again, such an easy fix. If you have it to where timelines and universes are different, then it wouldn't matter how many timelines America exists in because the result is ultimately the same. There's only one universe where America exists. I mean, technically even then, that still wouldn't be true because say she's in one universe and decides to leave, then there would also be a version of her that decides to stay and so now she would just exist simultaneously in two separate universes, I guess. The real point being made here is that the multiverse is a concept about which we know frighteningly little and the writers of these shows and movies don't really seem to have that good a grasp on it, which in that case I'd really rather they not even try telling stories with these concepts. Wait, hang on. Telling us that America is the only one who has this power means that even Strange and Wanda, the most powerful magic users in this world, are unable to travel between universes, right? Except we know that Strange can easily tamper with the fabric of the multiverse just by using some dust and a simple enough spell. I mean, if the spell can pull an infinite amount of people from their own universes into the 616 timeline, then surely it wouldn't be that hard to reverse the effects and send yourself to any reality of your choosing. I guess the Darkhold didn't know about this spell, otherwise Wanda could have just done that. Maybe she could have used her friendship with Strange to gain access to Kamertage, and then she could have studied all the books in the library to learn about this power. Who knows, she may not have even had to do that. This is a spell that any sorcerer seems to know about. At the very least, Strange and Wong seemed pretty casual about it, and even willingly gave this information to Peter, despite the fact that he's not a magic user. In any case, I'm really not sure what Wanda can and can't do, and I don't think Michael Waldron knows either. I actually might be willing to wager that he's never even seen WandaVision, if for no other reason than because he clearly didn't get the memo that Wanda apparently was the good guy by the end. They'll never know what you sacrificed for them. <laughs> 
But I feel it's relevant to bring this up, not only because this show is officially the first installment in Phase 4 and so quite literally signifies the beginning of the end, but it's also where I can identify the first signs that we were in trouble. It wasn't that long ago, so I'm sure you all remember the frustrating fakeouts this show did, being that they cast Evan Peters to make us believe he was some sort of multiverse variant of the Pietro from the X-Men films. They made fans think that this was our first official entry into the multiverse, and Mephisto was gonna be involved, and Doctor Strange was gonna come in and help Wanda take him down, and then they just turned it into a joke about boners. Which at the time, while I considered it a low blow on Marvel's part to pull the wool over our eyes like that, I didn't actually have a problem with it. But the more I've thought about it, the more I've realized that none of it makes any sense. For one thing, why does someone who looks like Evan Peters exist in this universe but isn't Pietro? Again, this is the same as the Three Peters issue in No Way Home, and we know for a fact thanks to Multiverse of Madness that the X-Men universe is meant to be part of this multiverse, so this version of Pietro does exist. So why would his variant look like this? if there's a human being on Earth 616 who looks like this. Now, you might be answering by saying that it's all completely arbitrary and dependent on which familiar actor will gain more views from the audience, and you're absolutely right. That's exactly why it is the way that it is. And that's the fucking problem. I know I sound like a broken record here, but I wouldn't even take issue with this if it were a matter of alternate universes rather than alternate timelines. Multiverse of Madness also does this really bizarre thing where Wanda's whole motivation is that she wants to take America's powers for herself so that she can travel the multiverse at will. Because in every single other universe that exists, her children, who she manifested into existence in WandaVision, exist and are all living with their respective versions of Wanda. And once again, we're dealing with statistical impossibility considering just how much every there is. But also, once again, if we're dealing with alternate timelines, then that simply can't be true. There are plenty of other timelines that would have been created since the events of WandaVision considering decisions continued being made by anyone and everyone, so right there, that already means that there are countless other universes where Billy and Tommy do not exist. And I question how they would exist in the first place, considering in the show she conjured them with magic. They don't have a father. So in these other universes in which they exist, did she also create them using magic? And if so, why can't 616 Wanda just do that? Apparently, in order to create living beings out of nothing, she has to create a hex like she did over Westview. And obviously, because of how everything went down in WandaVision, she had to take the Westview hex down because because the people she enslaved begged her for their freedom. She's so misunderstood, guys, we stand. But why can't she just create another Hex and then recreate Billy and Tommy inside of it? I, I mean, sure, that would make for a limited space for them to exist in, but again, I'm assuming that's how they're able to exist in any other universe, so the same thing would be the case no matter which universe she settles into, right? And I mean, you can create as many living beings as you want inside of a Hex, so it's not a matter of your children being lonely. Just conjure them up some friends. Make a Hex around a really large, empty mass of land and create a whole society away from the rest of the world. Or do it on a different planet altogether, your options are practically limitless. Unless we're meant to believe that all the other versions of Billy and Tommy were created the normal way, which would lead me to wonder who exactly is their father? Surely not Vision, right? Can he do that? Oh yeah, where is Vision? Why doesn't she want to find a universe where he's alive too? And how come the 616 version of him that is alive by the end of WandaVision hasn't come looking for her yet? Surely she's not that hard to find if Doctor Strange could do it so easily. Regardless of whatever answer we come up with, I don't think there actually is one, because I don't think the writers thought about it. However, going off of what's known, my assumption here is that none of these versions of Billy and Tommy are actually real, and that means every other one of these Wandas is currently in their own sort of West view, which means that they're probably not any more innocent than 616 Wanda unless their hexes only extend to the borders of their homes, and she's therefore not actually hurting anybody. But honestly, with Wanda Maximoff, I just don't know what to believe. Also, the main alternate Wanda we follow in this movie, 838 Wanda, comes from a universe where Thanos was actually defeated before he could do the big snap, so I wonder if that should mean Vision is alive? Maybe this universe doesn't even have a Vision at all, since there doesn't appear to be an active Tony Stark or Bruce Banner, and I guess if that's the case, then Wanda's reasons for creating Billy and Tommy have no attachment to her grief. That would probably be the best explanation to go with as a writer, but none of that's really explored, so oh well. Also, while I'm on the subject of Earth 838, let me finally get into why I hate the usage of the term Earth 616 when referring to the main MCU timeline. The only reason I've been using it this whole video is because I hate when people are talking about the MCU and say shit like, our universe, our Wanda, our Doctor Strange. It's 
annoying. We don't live in this universe. This is the equivalent of when you're a fan of a sports team and you say shit like, oh, we made the playoffs this year. Like, no, you fucking didn't. You sat on the couch and yelled at your TV screen for three hours. You contributed nothing. It's obnoxious. So for those who don't know, in the comics there are a lot of different continuities over the course of several decades, but because the multiverse exists within Marvel canon, we can kind of just say that every continuity coexists with one another, but are isolated to their own respective universes. And in this way, you kind of get to have it so that all the movie franchises, all the TV shows, all the comics and video games and so on are all part of one giant continuity. It's all very cool. The main universe in the comics, where most of the modern stories from the last, like, 30 years takes place is, you guessed it, Earth-616. And like I was just saying, if the comics and the movies all exist in the same multiverse, then it wouldn't really make sense for there to be another 616 universe, right? But in Multiverse of Madness, the 838 version of Christine Palmer tells us that she's in charge of categorizing all the universes universes, and she's designated the main universe as Earth-616. And like, I mean, this doesn't objectively canonize that the MCU's main universe is now 616. It's not like the Watcher or one of the other celestial big wigs were like, oh, this is Earth-616. This is where fucking Thor the Dark World takes place. I don't know why I specifically said Thor the Dark World. For whatever reason, that was just the first MCU movie that sprang to mind. But the intent of the line is pretty clear. The powers that be want to use 616 in their branding because they know it'll make all the comic fans cream their pants, and so they had Christine say this line. So while some random woman in one of infinite realities saying something that means ultimately nothing doesn't actually solidify that this is Earth-616, it's pretty obvious that that's what we're meant to assume. Interestingly enough, I had the same problems with Mysterio throwaway line in Far From Home, wherein he also referred to this universe as 616. The only reason I dismissed it at the time was because the story he fabricated about being from another universe turned out to not be true, so I was able to just chalk it up to, oh, Mysterio said a random number, which happened to be a reference to the comics. It's not like these movies aren't known for little easter eggs like that, so I was totally fine with it. But what I find hilarious is that I'm not the only one who picked up on this. Other fans remembered the Mysterio line and found it a bit coincidental, and the only answer that Mr. Waldron here was able to give us was, um, it's just a coincidence? I don't know. And I mean, I guess I could buy the coincidence that Mysterio just happened to randomly say the same exact number that some person from an alternate timeline also assigned to their Earth. That's really not that big a deal as far as I'm concerned. I just think it's funny is all. It's also emblematic of the problem at hand and the whole reason I've just spent the last 30 minutes picking apart these little details. It's all just so inconsistent because the writers don't care enough to pay attention. And listen, I'm really bad at remembering shit. My memory is not what it used to be and that allows a lot of continuity errors to go over my head. So if I'm pointing this shit out, then there's probably a shit ton more that I didn't even cover. Now I almost forgot that I was going to take this opportunity to shit all over Morbius again, which is always fun. I suppose it's not entirely fair. I mean, everyone knows this movie is bad, but man, that post credit scene looks like it was edited on fucking iMovie. Plus, once again, we're dealing with multiverse rules that don't make a lick of sense. I know this is Sony, and so the fault might not necessarily belong to the MCU on this one, but it revolves entirely around an MCU character and plays off of what was established in an MCU film, so I'm counting it. It doesn't make any sense that Vulture is here right now in the Sony-verse given what rules were defined regarding Doctor Strange's spell in No Way Home, but you already know all that. Instead, I'm gonna get meta for a second and look at what this does to the story of MCU Spider-Man going forward. The end of Homecoming set up a plethora of cool directions this character could have been taken in going forward, and frankly, the two following films absolutely squandered it. I'm not even saying I wanted him to be a villain again. In fact, I would probably have hated it if that was the route they took. And look, that's exactly what was set up in Morbius. <sighs> for fuck's sake. Yeah, I should have killed all of us. No, I would have wanted there to be conflict between him and Scorpion, where Scorpion knows Tombs is hiding something, tensions continue to rise to the point where Vulture is no longer safe in prison, and maybe Peter even sees that, and his responsibility is to help him out. Or maybe Nacho uses Tombs' love for his family against him by sending people after Liz to extort the information out of him. Maybe Tombs feels bad for giving Peter up, but he would do it again a hundred times over if it meant protecting his little girl. The point is, there are a lot of potential story threads they could have gone with that are just out of the question now, and that's really annoying. And coming out of Multiverse of Madness, I'm starting to see a recurring theme there. I mean, we've waited six 
years since the first Doctor Strange to see a follow-up to Mordo's story, only for Multiverse of Madness to include the character and acknowledge his continuing existence in this world, but then only to give us an alternate version of the character with absolutely no history with the version of Strange that we actually care about. It's just so bizarre. I don't understand Marvel's obsession with not following up the story threads that they set up at the end of their own films. It'd be both sad and hilarious if we never ended up getting a Black Knight movie starring Kit Harington at any point in the future, despite the fact that that was set up at the end of Eternals. I mean, I joke, but the fact that I could clearly see that happening just makes me really, really sad. Phase 4 of the MCU has had a lot more problems than just this. There's also the character assassinations that have been dealt, the terrible world building, unfinished CGI, the shows that are just straight up unenjoyable, even in the fun, stupid kind of way. But my main issue for the last several months has been this, and Multiverse of Madness was really the straw that broke the camel's back, so I finally decided to make this video. And at this point, I think I'm kind of just checked out with the MCU. I can clearly see where it's going, and I don't think I'll like it. I'll watch the stuff that looks interesting, but I don't really think I'll be making any more videos about this at any point in the foreseeable future. This video was originally going to be a review of Multiverse of Madness and Moon Knight, and at a certain point I even decided to throw in Eternals and Hawkeye since I never gave my opinions on those and people have been asking for them, but I really just don't feel like spending any more energy on this franchise. I've reached a point where I basically just don't consider anything after Endgame to be canon to the MCU. I liked Far From Home and No Way Home a lot, but I just put those in their own separate Spider-Verse category, and as far as the MCU is concerned, it consists of all the movies of Phases 1 through 3 and the Netflix series, and ended in 2019 when Tony said, I am Iron Man, and snapped his fingers. They've recently announced a Disney Plus Daredevil show in the works that's meant to be a continuation of the Netflix series, but for reasons that should be pretty clear by now, I have pretty little faith that it will be handled well. If for no other reason than because the last several Disney Plus shows I've watched recently have shown me that Disney is not willing to have a main protagonist who is anything other than absolutely morally good, even when that doesn't even remotely fit their character. And people like Matt Murdock or Frank Castle are not just characters you can tone down to fit the mold of the lighthearted, fun MCU. If you are looking for a great review of Moon Knight and Multiverse of Madness, my boy Logan actually made a video talking about them, and it's pretty neat. Go give it a watch, tell him Papa Sheev sent you, and, you know, if you're a real homie, you'll leave a sexually charged comment for him to be utterly horrified by. I don't know, I just think that would be funny. Also, my official recommendation for you if you're looking for a good movie about the multiverse, Everything Everywhere All at Once is really good, and it unfortunately flew under the radar when it released a couple months ago. But it's actually out on digital now, so do yourself a favor and give it a watch. Whatever you do, just stop giving the MCU the same amount of support they've been getting. They don't deserve it. Who knows, though, maybe She-Hulk will be good. Ah! Ah!